All right. Let's do this. We talked about Sh Holchinsky. Does anybody have any other further questions about rickets? It's a vitamin D deficiency that leads to uh, improperly mineralized bones. The bone, there's like a lot of collagen in these bones, but not enough of the hydroxy appetite. So they're, they're They're bending, yeah. Do they? No, no, they just break. They just break? No. They break. Okay. Um, let's move on. So uh, this is, I put this slide in uh, last time because it's kind of interesting. It's a, it's a story of this guy here named Elmer McCollum. He uh, was, you know, considered to be America's doctor or Dr. Vitamin. Um, he lived in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and he was the guy that actually discovered vitamin D in 1922, about 100 years ago. We've known about vitamin D for about 100 years. Um, and he was able to treat rickets with vitamin D3 uh, a year later. Uh, so he is the person that discovered that it was actually vitamin D, not just UV light. That was Shinsky, who, uh, who had been, uh, who had discovered, uh, I don't know, like five, ten years earlier, that UV light was a way to treat rickets. Uh, actually, um, he discovered vitamin D, and then it was, and this was what was actually lacking in people's diets. Because of this, um, it's, it's interesting about it. He did so. There's like real, uh, there was real research that uh, gave rise to this. Uh, in fact, actually, this is a story of sex medicine. Slide up. Of course I do. Of course I do. Uh, but it was actually a postdoc of his. Really remarkable. She had come from Stanford, a PhD at Stanford, which is a And then had applied to be a postdoc with this guy at Madison. Had gotten turned down twice, but appealed it to the Board of Governors of Stanford University. Eventually was let in to the program and was actually the person that discovered the vitamin D. Anyways, uh, but this guy here, Dr. Vitamin, uh, turns out, even though there was real science behind it, he also got on the payroll of the American Dairy Farmers Association. Uh, vitamin D itself, you've seen that structure. You remember that it is made from cholesterol. Uh, the action of, you, of ultraviolet light, sunlight, and cholesterol in your skin. So it's a fat-soluble vitamin. Because of that, it's able to dissolve into, uh, into milk very well. Milk is an excellent uh, vehicle for vitamin, vitamin D. And the dairy producers of the United States, as soon as vitamin D was recognized, they, yeah, what, what is going on? Dude, just go back by the drum kit. Just go back by the drum kit. You got the rolly wheelchair. Just go back. I, I'm not sure what you're doing. I can't handle it. Go back. Okay. I'll move on. I don't need it. Um, so he was getting funded by the American dairy producers and uh, came out with this. Milk was the greatest of all protective foods, and milk consumption skyrocketed in the United States after this. So, you know, the, the dairy industry was pretty happy about all that. And then suddenly all this marketing comes out here. Vitamin-rich milk and nourishing foods. Like, look at all these happy people about to chug some dairy. I'm not, I'm not hating on dairy, but um, this is why vitamin D, A and D milk are such a staple in our diet. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, he was, so Dr. Vitamin was like on all these magazines 
uh, interviews, he'd be on radio. Uh, it's like a scientist. Science says the guy that discovered vitamin D says drink milk. That kind of thing. For better. Well, sure. It's a it's a source of vitamin D. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. It's, it, it, vitamin D supplied. But it was it's an example of how like corporate marketing science. can lead to suspicious claims. I'm not going to go into the whole story of McCollum completely, but he did. He said other things later on that were quite scientific. Oh, that's that, Margaret Davis. It's been a while since I've talked about her. Yeah. Finally, uh, getting the recognition that she deserves. So uh, there are no African Americans in the classroom. But it is a, it's an interesting uh, uh, case study. There's this vitamin D paradox in African Americans. It's, it's pretty interesting. African Americans have uh, a systematically lower vitamin D in their bloodstream than other people. They're deficient. But despite that, um, they have higher bone densities uh, than. Um, and a lower incidence of bone fracture occasionally for white people. And you can imagine, uh, you may think, well, if you're just looking at the fact that African are less likely to break their bones of other sorts, that maybe that's due to the fact that they have more melanin in their skin, maybe that D actually they is preventing the issue. But they have these other adaptations because their skin is uh, so dark and, and prevents them from making a lot of vitamin D. They have um, uh, intestinal resistance to a vitamin D metabolite and skeletal resistance to the action of uh, parathyroid. Remember, thyroid is a hormone calcium low dissolves bone and raises calcium level in your blood. Yes, absolutely. These are adapted, these are adaptations that people of African descent uh, have developed because their skin is darker and, and, and consequently they have lower vitamin D uh, capacity in their skin uh, when compared to Caucasians. Exposed to the same amount. It's kind of interesting. So here is um, a slide that's just sort of like high recapping what we talked about last week. Uh, and after this, I'm going to go into what kind of lifestyle choices you should make that uh, will support healthy skeleton, healthy bones throughout life. Healthy connective tissue. But first, this recap. So uh, you'll remember there were three hormones uh, calcitonin, which is the one that tones the uh, calcium in your blood down when calcium is high. And then the other two are calcitriol and PTH. Calcitriol is a downstream metabolite of vitamin D. Calcitriol uh, is essentially vitamin D. Uh, and then the parathyroid. So what happens is you eat whatever you eat um, and we get vitamin D from the sun but the calcium you have to eat right so uh, you eat about um, a gram of calcium a day and to give you a sense of how much calcium that is a penny is five grams. So imagine like a fifth of, or maybe like a paper clip about a penny. So it's a small paper so you need about that much calcium in, in the day. It goes into the digestive tract uh, where some of it gets absorbed, about 65% uh, of it gets absorbed, uh, which can vary depending upon the vitamin D uh, in your circulation. And about 350 milligrams gets lost in the feces every day. Um, and then 
The rest gets absorbed by the uh, GI tract, goes into the blood, uh, gets, uh, some of it gets stored in the bone, uh, and then the bone is remodeling. So to keep uh, the bones at a steady state, you're going to have to have as much deposited as is being uh, dissolved and resorbed. Steady state. The bones are not, in like an adult, the bones are remodeling, but they're not growing in size. Uh, the blood itself gets filtered. Uh, you lose some calcium. Some of it uh, gets absorbed. And then the urinary loss is that other 65%. So... 35% uh, goes out of the feces, the rest of it, the 65% <coughs> cycles through here, and then it's coming out through the, through the urine. And with that, we have to have this balance, right? If we had 1,000 milligrams a day and we are losing 350 through the feces and only 600 milligrams were going out in the urine every day, then with time we would be gaining 50 milligrams of calcium a day hypercalcemic. We have too much calcium in the body. So there needs to be a steady state of calcium in the body. Does that make sense? And again, you can see here this like 10 milligrams per deciliter. Pretty low concentration, but a steady concentration of calcium in the blood. It's a very important number. I showed you that, that chart that shows how comparing calcium levels and PTH, the parathyroid hormone, is one way to diagnose different types of disease. All right, so you guys are all right here. You're all right here on this curve, all right? Here's age in years, and you're all about like 15, 16, 17. You're in between these two uh, tick marks, and so you're right up here. Uh, you, you're only about half of your peak bone mass. As you get older, your bones will continue to increase in bone mass. You reach peak bone mass about 10 years from now. All right? So uh, bone, bone uh, mass is going to continue to go up. From that window, from about 25 to 45, your bone mass hits a relative plateau. Just like that. All Um, so, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, bone responds to uh, compression. It, it responds to use. All right? Men tend to have more muscle mass on their body, um, and that's going to be one thing that's driving a higher bone density in, in men. Um, and secondly, various androgenic hormones, meaning the sex hormones. The gender hormone. Uh, various hormones are going to have an effect on that uh, calcium cycling and, and the ability to store calcium in the bones. So I've talked about calcitriol, calcitonin, and PTH, but we're going to talk about some others right now. One of the important androgenic hormones is estrogen. So uh, estrogen is in men and women. Both men and women have estrogen. Uh, women have much more estrogen uh, circulating than men do. And estrogen uh, encourages calcium storage. Estrogen encourages calcium storage. Um, after about 45 years of age, women's bone density drops off a cliff. About 45, 50 years of age, women's bone density drops off a cliff. That's because they hit menopause and they're endogenous, meaning their, their native uh, estrogen production drops off a cliff. When you hit menopause, women stop making as much estrogen because they just don't need to drive uh, the ovarian cycle anymore, the ovulation, the production of eggs. They, they, that's not happening. Menopause happens, which means that whole the menstrual cycle, the ovarian cycle, the uterine that all stops. Uh, and because estrogen drops, bone density goes down. Bone density goes down. You may imagine, yeah. 
when bone density goes down, uh, we get first osteopenia and then osteoporosis. And we'll see some pictures describing the different. But uh, here's a, a person of 55 years of age, right? Uh, and then uh, with time, 65, 75 years of age, these people's bone density is going, is going down, and the bones are getting softer. They're getting softer. There's less calcium, hydroxyapatite, phosphate. There's less mineral in the bone and more just the soft tissue, the collagen fibers. And so bent bones become more bendy and gravity does its thing. This is why old people start to look more. Their skeletons do this. They, they compress with This is why, so the point of me showing you this is to tell you that the choices that you make in this part of your life here have a greater impact on what happens out in that part of the curve than any other time. It's from like starting, yeah, in, into, I mean, it's good to get in those habits now, uh, but starting from like the 20s up to like the mid 40s. Well, that's, that's the time. That is the time when uh, when the choices you make are going to have the, the greatest impact on your outcome. Who has a, a grandmother who has broken a hip or fallen and broken some kind of hip? Yeah. Who has a it's coming for everyone, and you have the, the power to deal with it. I can tell you, I know it's easy to think, oh, future, whatever, I'm going to be ever. Time arose everywhere. Time arose everywhere. We're going to get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Soy is a complicated thing because it has phytoestrogens that uh, complicate the calcium. But, yeah. All right. So, anyways, the point here on this slide is that estrogen, there's a, several points, but one of the main ones is that uh, estrogen is able to uh, maintain bone density because it keeps osteoclasts in check. When there is uh, estrogen, osteoclasts are doing their job kind of like this. And you get rid of the estrogen, and then the osteoclasts start doing it, their job much more quickly, uh, eroding bone. And the osteoblast, it's in excess of the rate that the osteoblasts are building. Right? It's, when estrogen's gone, it takes the, the regulatory, one of the regulatory mechanisms off the osteoblast. Right? And you may be able to understand this because women during their their child uh, birthing years, what did what else happens during that period of time? If they have a child, they lactate. There's lots of calcium in in milk, and so it's in the in the interest of women to maintain high uh, calcium stores after uh, you know between menarche and menopause, it's good to have high levels of calcium. After that, there's not an evolutionary advantage to maintaining high calcium levels, right? Because you're not going to reproduce after menopause. And so the benefits are more secondary rather than evolutionary pressure is secondary, not, not a high uh, bone density. Yeah. So the short answer to your question here is diet and exercise. The right eating, and when I say diet, I don't mean losing weight. I mean eating the right kind of nutrition, the right nutritional regimen, and exercise. So I showed you. Um, let's look at this chart first before I, I talk about this thing. Um, so. At age 25, at the beginning of that period, about 84% of people have normal bone density. Have normal bone density. And, normal, and so what we look at, what you're looking at here 
is, um, is a normal distribution. So like, let's assume everybody in this class is 70. If I took bone densities of everyone, you wouldn't all have the same bone density. Most of you would be, and so this is bone density along here, and each of these is different ages. Most of you would have this bone density here in the blue region. And blue region is normal. This uh, teal color is sort of like early onset osteoporosis. Osteopenia just means thinning of the bone. And then osteoporosis means thinning and getting pores, holes, crevices eroded into the structure. Yeah, yeah, I'll show you some pictures. It's not fun. Um, so anyways, most people at the age of 25 have normal bone density. In fact, 84%. Uh, about 15% have osteopenia, and a very little, uh, a very small percentage of young people, some people do have osteopenia. As you age, this curve shifts, right? So this is 25. This is 35, this is 45, 55, 65, 75. So by the time you're at 75 uh, or 80 on, in this chart, 10%, one in 10 people actually still has normal bones. You see those old folks that are still kicking ass. It's out there, right? One, so there's two, four, six, eight, ten 10 of you out there. Chances are that one of the 10 of you, when you are 80 years old, is, if you're alive, let's we'll assume you guys all make it to that point. Uh, one of you will have uh, normal bones, right? Well, maybe because you're hearing this information now, maybe it'll be more than one of you. Maybe it'll be two or three. Maybe I'm able to affect this. Maybe it'll be all of you. Who knows? I, I have hope. I have hope. All right. But, in fact, uh, the vast majority, half, over half of you, will have osteoporosis by the time you get into your older. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, 90%. No, no, I said that for him. Oh, yeah. He said he would make it. Oh, you'll so. make it. All right, so here's osteoporosis. This is a healthy bone, and you can see in an osteoporotic bone, there's been bone wasting. The, the dense bone structure is thin, and then in the spongy bone, the spicules, the trabeculae, uh, they are, uh, the cavities are larger, the spicules are thinner. Uh, here's an example of a healthy bone, and here's what osteoporotic bone looks like. Much easier to break this bone. Imagine right here, this bone is would be very easy to break. This would be uh, probably femur. So this is the head of your femur. And this is probably spongy bone. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the head of the femur would probably be like this big. Yeah, if it was like shrunk down, it would be like that big. Uh, a lot of money, too, for people who don't care about their health and just think about money. A lot of money here. Um, there are about 9 million fractures per year worldwide. That's, uh, there's is a fracture due to osteoporosis between the hips every three seconds. Another person every three seconds who is who's breaking one of their hips. That's uh, a qu quarter of a billion people. Quarter, I'm sorry, a quarter of a billion women. It disproportionately affects women. Uh, so a quarter of a billion people worldwide. That's a lot of freaking people, folks. That's a lot of women breaking their hips. So uh, fractures happen to one in 10 women age 60, and two out of three women by the age of 90 have broken. Those are pretty rough statistics. Uh, by next year, uh, it's going to cost the United States alone uh, 61 million. Oh, no, 61 million. I'm sorry, uh, 61 million people in the U.S. by 2020. Uh, that's, it's going to cost, it cost 28 billion, B with a billion. Trump wanted 5 billion to build his wall. 
cost our country twenty eight billion to just deal with hip injuries. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that the United States is yeah. because the general the general health of America is rather oh. low compared to similar countries in well developed countries, countries that our nation, the United States, the health of Well, it's bad for women because of physically bad for women. And also diet is notoriously for bad. Not only that, it's it's the way we sit. People sit in chairs. So our hips, most Americans. This sit around the cultures, people sit so the hips are getting stressed that aren't because of that. There's increased. Yeah, opioids certainly, certainly are. Okay. Uh, all right. So here's another picture. You wanted a picture. This is a. Oh yeah, Jacob. Yeah. Uh, this is another picture of uh, the trabeculae, the spongy bone. Uh, this would be in a healthy person. You can see this. This little spicule of bone is fairly intact. But when you look at someone with uh, osteoporosis. You see there's all these little pores, osteobone porosis, having pores in them. So uh, these are uh, kind of e eroded, uh, eroded <laughs> bone tissue. Okay? Yeah. And that leads, so in a, in a normal person, here's a, it's a healthy spine. In a person with osteoporosis, this lead. I mean, who doesn't have someone in their family that looks like that, right? The like... This, the, the kyphosis is in the upper back, lordosis is in the lower back, this kyphotic, this kyphotic spine. All right. So how do we treat it? How do we treat it? There's a lot of different ways that uh, we use. Um, I guess I don't really need to have this up there. I'm not going to go through that. But uh, estrogen... Uh, affects osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteocytes in different ways. Uh, it also affects uh, T cells, which are immune cells that themselves interact with osteoclasts. Um, and I, we're not gonna, I'm not going to go through the biochemical. But um, the point of this is to show that estrogen is central. It's, it's very central in regulating the activity of of all of these bone cells. Uh, and so one of the things that people do is estrogen replacement therapy, right? Uh, this is going to slow bone resorption, slow down the process of osteoclastic bone, estrogen re replacement therapy. Shots, you go in like a 55, 65, 70. Estrogen shots. For men, it can go. Uh, there are, I'll tell this story just because it's a weird one. In, when I lived in New Zealand, you know, we had a midwife, captain, weird, her around all that down there. And there was, our, our midwife was this woman, bank, amazing. But one of the things that they do down there, some people, 
they will save the placenta from a birth and then they freeze dry it. They freeze dry it, meaning they it's like basically dehydrated, uh, freeze dried, not a heat. They freeze it and then you put it on low pressure to evacuate. It's like space uh, astronaut that freeze dry. So uh, they would freeze dry it and then they take it and powder it up and put it in a capsule. So uh, you go through menopause, you have to take these pills because your placenta is super high in that it's like Ameliorates. Anyways, estrogen replacement therapy, whether it's a shot in the arm, it's uh, is one way to slow it. There are drugs, of course, you can get. The drug companies have them, and uh, yeah, Fosamax, Actinel, whatever. These, the, the job of these is to kill the osteoclast, the, the cytotoxic. Class, kill them. Um, but uh, the problem is it leads to osteoporosis. That word means osteonecrosis. Necro. What word? The necro. Dead. Yeah, bone death. Bone death. Osteonecrosis. So. By killing off your osteoclast, it turns out that you, you can have osteoporosis. Not really uh, a desirable thing. You have like high density bones, but they're dead, they're not ever responsive to mineral recycling or whatever. Uh, not the best option. Uh, there are there is Well, the bone is there. It's just like, I mean, you know, if you get like a, a joint replacement type of thing, it still works. It, it, it just won't respond. There's no bone. There's no recycling of bone replacement. So if you in a year, it's not like and because of that it, it actually can lead to fractures and other problems as well. Uh, also it's bad because it's tissue that's infection of the bone. Uh, PTH thyroid treatment um, and you can, that can slow it down if you uh, do get these on a daily basis but this is like a band-aid right like the problem was not that you had low PTH the problem is that you have osteoporosis maybe not maybe low calcium. So PTH is one way to deal with it and it can increase the, uh, the bone density, but it's not ideal. The best, the most ideal is prevention. Prevention. Doing now what uh, you wish you might have done. Uh, so exercise and diet between the ages of 25 and 40 is best. So now we're at, I'd like all this science, all this science, Dr. K, you're killing me with science. Uh, all this science just to get to the point of telling you what uh, I hope you take with you outside of this class. I only have a minute, so I'm not going to get through it all. But um, yeah, weight bearing exercise on bone density. I'm going to I'm going to show you in acute detail next time how weight bearing exercise actually affects bone density so that you don't just have to take my word for it, I'll understand it and see it. Um, 
So when you have this mineral recycling, it, it allows those bones to adapt to stress. This is why osteoporosis is bad, right? because the bones can adapt uh, to stress. The more you stress the bone, uh, the, the thicker and stronger it becomes. Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, yeah, you can stretch. It's about finding the, the like, the sweet spot. Um, and then yoga is a great way to uh, get some weight bearing exercise because not only does it have a direct Im impact on the bone, but it reduces stress hormones like cortisol. We haven't talked about cortisol at all yet, but it is a stress hormone that comes from your super renal gland and has uh, a real impact on the bone. You can imagine when the stress hormones go up. Uh, that it liberates more calcium from your bone and can speed up uh, resorption of high So yoga, like keeping stress and various other associated inflammatory hormones down, um, that will allow there to be a normal healthy balance between osteoporosis. Okay, I'm going to let it go there. <laughs> We'll uh, we'll come back we'll come back to the slide next time. I'll finish up talking about any questions. <laughs>